And on behalf of Mr Michael Bell, I thank you for coming to this service today. This service is to commemorate Michael's life and acknowledge his impact and influence on ourselves and the community in general. This service is to commemorate Michael's life and acknowledge his impact and influence on ourselves and the community in general. The reason for the format of the funeral arrangements today is to reflect more closely the life and values of Mr Michael Bell. There are many of you who have travelled great distances to be here today and I know your efforts to attend this service, to pay your last respects and to support this family have been appreciated. Human beings have sensed the mystery of death and the pain of grief since time immemorial. Every society has developed rights to mark the passage through life and death and to commemorate the dead. Today we do this through the funeral service and the rites by which we lay a person's body to rest. The wounds of, of grief need time and care to heal. The funeral may help this process by enabling us to acknowledge our loss, give thanks for the life of the person who has died, make our last farewell and begin to take up life once more. We are gathered here to celebrate, to reflect and give thanks for the life of Michael, to reflect on all he was to us and acknowledge our own grief at losing him and for the purpose of extending our deepest sympathy to all who mourn his death. It's appropriate at this time to read a small verse in memory of Michael and that's where I'll ask Jackson Pye to step forward and do just that. God looked around his garden. God looked around his garden and found an empty place. He then looked down upon the earth and saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. He knew that you were suffering. He knew you were in pain. He knew that you would never get well on earth again. He saw the road was getting rough and the hills were hard to climb. So he closed your weary eyelids and said, Peace be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone. For parts of us went with you the day God called you home. Thank you, Jackson. We should try to handle the grief we feel at the loss of Michael by remembering your loss must be reviewed hang on to your grief long enough to allow its full effects to settle on your soul some members of our society will say move on fix it quick but historically people took time to grieve for grief is a natural outlet for dealing with our sorrow and pain so remember cherish your memories of Michael tears of joy will come as well as tears of sadness and we can only begin to move on when we understand that grief is the price we pay for the privilege of love. For grief and love are two emotions that are absolutely inseparable. They are like the two sides of the same coin. Grief does not exist except where there has been love. We do not grieve for anyone we have not loved and it might not be quite so obvious but similarly Love does not exist, except that in loving we undertake to pay for all the joys and privileges of love in the experience of grief and parting. None of us can know where that's going to be. For some, it is sooner. For some, it is later. But inevitably, everything has its price. I think it's true that we don't get anything for nothing. Everything has its price and grief is the price we pay for the privilege of love. 
The memories of Michael you have as a relative or a friend will always be there and there would be no sorrow in your heart today if yesterday you had not known the pleasure of Michael's presence in your life. And now to help us realise what Michael's presence meant, I would ask Chelsea to step forward and read her own verse. For others, you were Dad or Pa, but for me, you're always just Michael or MJB. Childhood memories may be few and far between, but there are several that were not a dream. Perhaps at a distance, you were always still there, both in location and how you'd show you care. Sending us letters, collecting stamps, sharing stories of madam and arresting scamps. Chinese food dinners with ice cream deep fried, strawberry milkshakes on nice walks outside. Werribee Zoo, the invisible giraffe, this one never fails to give me a laugh. Rest now, Pa Michael, free from pain and harm, after 10 years of waiting to be back in Mama's arms. Thank you, Chelsea. And if I could now ask Ken to step forward and read the eulogy. I would like to begin by thanking everyone for being here today to, to celebrate Michael's life. A special thanks for those who have travelled a long distance to be here is great, greatly appreciated. I would also like to welcome people watching online. Michael, Dad, Pa or MJB as people knew him always said to me when this day happened he wanted everyone to celebrate his life and not to feel sad. He had a wonderful life and wished only for a private family gathering. As a lot of you know, over the years, Michael was always very punctual for work commitments, although when it came to other matters, he could keep you waiting. <laughs> Even when you told him the meeting time was half an hour earlier than you planned. I'm quite surprised that on this occasion he's actually made it on time for once. <laughs> Michael James Bell was born on the 24th of June 1936 in Lanarkal, Vanuatu. He was the only child of Henry and Daphne Bell. His father Henry came from the Dumfries in Scotland and his mother Daphne was from the family farm Glenarara near Seymour. Henry was a Pres Presbyterian church minister working at a missionary at White Sands, Vanuatu. Only six months into Daphne's pregnancy, sorry, pregnancy, Daphne fell quite ill, putting the lives of both herself and Michael in danger. Daphne had to trek across the island to the Narco Hospital. The last few miles she was carried on stretcher by the Nai Vanuatu men. An emergency cesarean section was performed to save the lives of Dad and Daphne. A very premature Michael was delivered weighing only 1.58 kilograms. Three days later, Daphne had to have emergency surgery to remove her appendix. The island woman looked after Michael till his mother recovered. Michael and Daphne then returned to Australia for seven months to recover at her parents' property at Glenaroa. Michael then returned to Vanuatu and was raised amongst the Nivatian children at the mission in White Sands. It was here Dad embraced the island life and developed his love for swimming. He often told his grandchildren this is how he got his whale barnacles on his back. <laughs> when Michael was seven years old, he was sent to boarding school at Knox College, Sydney, and only got to return home by DC-3 and flying boat on occasions. Michael then moved with his parents to Wakatani in the Bay of Plenty, New Zealand for three years until his parents moved back to Alawa, Vanuatu. 
He loved his family time and beach life in New Zealand. When Dad was 12 years old, he returned to Australia to attend boarding school at Scots College, Aubrey. I can remember Dad telling me a story about his time at boarding school when he got busted on the weekend swimming in the Murray River, as the Murray River was strictly off limits for students. He was unlucky to have picked a spot near where the headmaster was having a picnic with his family. <laughs> Upon return to school the next day, he was called down to the headmaster's office for punishment. <laughs> Typical dad. <laughs> when Michael was about 18, he'd finished school, he went to live with his parents, who had moved back from Vanuatu to live at Mayfield, a suburb of Newcastle, New South Wales. During this, he was called up to complete his national service. Whilst living in Mayfield, Dad met Mum at the Presbyterian Church Youth Group, and after a short romance, they were married by Michael's father, Henry, in Haverfield, Sydney, on the 3rd of May, 1958. Mum and Dad then moved to Victoria, as he had been accepted into the Victorian Police Force. Unfortunately, he missed out on the New South Wales Police Force, as, a, as in those days, they really liked burly police, large burly police officers, and he was unable to ascertain the required expanded chest measurement to join the New South Wales Police Force. Ooh, you made it. <laughs> Lucky they changed the rules. In 1959, Jackie was born, and I followed closely in 1961. I can remember Dad telling me a story about when he was a police cadet. They needed extra police for the Melbourne Olympics, so his class was sent out early to help. One day he managed to swim, managed to get a swim in at the Olympic pool in Melbourne. The only problem was, he, was that he managed to leave his police handcuffs behind. Scared of being in trouble, he went back to the pool later that night, scaled the fence and retrieved said handcuffs. Unbeknown to all of us, Dad would go on to utilise these fence climbing skills in the last four months of his life. The escapee. <laughs> I, can, I can also remember when I was about seven years old when we lived at Moore Park, then on a few occasions when he was on duty, the unmarked detective's car would turn up at our home with a boot full of bush rocks that he had just happened to find while he was out on patrol. We had such a nice rock garden wall. <laughs> Things have changed. During this time in the police force, Dad served in numerous squads and locations across Victoria, including Drug Squad, Night Wilds Car, Russell Street, Ringwood and Elsonwick. He was involved in search. He was involved in the search for Prime Minister Harold Holt, the Southern Aurora Railway disaster, the Westgate Bridge collapse, and he nearly caught the famous English train robber Ronald Biggs. In, in 1977, he married Lorraine Tippett and he became the stepfather to Pam, Pam, sorry, Peter, Gary, Janet and Glenn. Dad then started climbing the ranks and had to move around Victoria. He became the inspector in charge of Portland, chief inspector at Shepparton, superintendent at Geelong before retiring as a chief superintendent at Bendigo in 1987. He then spent time in Geelong as a real estate agent for LJ Hookers, security at Grace McKellar Rehab, and a bus driver for McHarry's Bus Services. After Lorraine died, Michael moved from Geelong to, ten, to Kensington Gardens at Shepparton until his health declined and he was placed in care at Cobram Regional Care Orch Orchard House, where he died on the 26th of the 6th, 2023. Just after his 87th birthday, yeah. by two days. Yeah. I would like to thank the staff at Orchard House for the round-the-clock care of Michael over the last 18, 18 months, and a special thanks... Special thanks to Nikki for her ongoing care to Michael and support for Jacqueline and myself as well as all family members during Dad's final, final days. The world is a sadder place without Michael in our lives, but Michael touched each and every one of us and has left us with memories 
we wish to cherish forever. And I'd just like to say now, um, after the conclusion of the service, we would like to invite everyone to attend the Commercial Club at Albury for finger food and drinks to celebrate Michael's life. We look forward to sharing memories and stories of Michael's life. Thank you. Thank you, Ken and Jackie. I'd ask Glenn and Peter to step forward now and add to Michael's story. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for marrying our mum, Lorraine, taking on five of the children and treating us as your own. Couldn't have been easy, although we were angels. <laughs> We may not be related by blood, but to all of us, you were dad, and always will be. Mum was the happiest while with you, and now you're both reunited again. Rest in peace, the Perrys. We love you, MJ. And I'd now ask Zoe to step forward to read our verse from Robbie Burns. An honest man here lies at rest, the friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age and guide of youth. Few hearts like his with virtue warmed, few heads with knowledge so informed. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there is none, he made the best of this. Thank you, Zoe. And now, if Jackie Pye, or Jackie used to be Belle, would like to step forward and tell us about her dad. Ken and I have always been a team, so he's hoping we can get through this. I got... Um, just wanted to elaborate a bit on what Ken said. So um, Dad was um, our world and <clears throat> and also our step family's world and we've all been blended and worked really well together. So thank you to everybody. That was beautiful words, boys. Um, Dad was a true old-fashioned gentleman. He had manners. He would open doors, pull out chairs. There was no swearing in women's company. I'm sure he learnt a lot of these skills at his time at Aubrey Grammar, which is now Scots College. He spent a lot of time there, um, as he didn't get to go home for holidays because his parents were so far away, and he was always farmed out to someone from the church or one of his aunties off to the farm at Glenarua and with Auntie Hazel a lot. So... At Scott's, he met his best mate, Tom Hollinger. Um, Tom ended up being Dad's mate for his life. He would spend a lot of time with him. He got his first job with um, Tom's family, um, driving the brick trucks. And <clears throat> Tom ended up being my godfather. And um, unfortunately, Tom was of sound mind, but his health failed and he passed away last June. His family have sent their thoughts and wishes here today and Graeme, his son, will be here but he's supporting the Australian cricket team in England. Go Australia. Um, I spoke with Tom last year before he passed and he said, I said, the two of you wouldn't have got up to much mischief because Tom was actually really quite shy. Um, a very quiet gentleman. And he said, oh no. He said, when we were renting a house in Box Hill, Tom had been a proficient shooter. He actually got chosen to go to the Olympics in 64. And Dad and he also, Dad used to shoot, but I think he shot more the, the um, farm type of shooting. Um, and they would put a hay bale at the end of their rented accommodations corridor and then shoot into the target on the hay bale. And I went, oh, you're joking. So I was very stunned at this little, little comment. Um, Dad loved dancing, photography as we all know and you'll see in the slideshow fish ponds, 
fish, gardens, birds and the outdoors. He loved going fishing and he loved going to the sea and the mountains. So, <clears throat> and he loved getting together with the family for holidays, wherever they were. And we'd always be out hiking somewhere, off looking at something and um, having a great time. Uh, Dad had some amazing adventures and um, he went twice on the Murray in Tinnies, once with Ken and once with us as well as, as the boys, with Glenn. Yeah, and um, we did get up to some mischief on that. We managed to set fire to a boat <laughs> and all survived, thank goodness. So he also had trips to visit with Don, with Ken in Darwin. So Donald, he had a wonderful time on that. We were looking through the photos yesterday. They were beautiful. Thank you for doing that with him. Donald and Debbie have been very supportive of Dad and have always made sure the families were connected. Thank you. Um, they went... Um, he went hiking with Ken and I on the Rootburn track. Lucky for us, he paid for us to go with supported it. We only had to carry our own stuff. We didn't have to carry our food and, and we had hot showers. That was great. Went to Uluru with Ken. He had some time in New Zealand, um, which was one of his passions, New Zealand. He had such a wonderful there for the three years that he actually got to live with his parents. And um, Helene and Lorraine went to that. He went to Tasmania with Brian and Kate and did a few other trips. And <clears throat> always, often we would go to um, the timeshare at um, Cedar Lakes and around. So he heavily influenced our kids as far as that sort of occupations were concerned. Tim has been influenced and is into his gardening, his frogs and his birds and his hiking. Um, and of course Emily is um, an environmental scientist. Is that correct Emily? Have I got it right? And she's she works as a fly in fly out worker now to make to do that. So um, Dad returned to Vanuatu with Lorraine on a trip and was treated like royalty and they got to see all the things that he had, where he had lived and, and done. He, <coughs> um, when they were at Tanner at White Sands, they were at the base of a volcano and they used to have ash and stuff, but they were also right on the cliff and used to swim every day in the, um, at the reef and collect lobsters and all the things, gourmet food. He still loved his, his lobster later on. So um, when he was in Fokotani, at, they looked out also over a volcano, White Island, and at other stations when they were in the New Hebrides or Vanuatu, they looked over Abraham, which is a volcano. So then he went to Portland, and of course they've also got um, Mount Eccles brim, Bim Bam, Budgie Bim is the new name for that. So he had a, that volcanic connection. He also had a wonderful trip with Mr Bruce and anyone in the police force would know Mr Bruce was the superintendent at Shepparton when Dad was the chief inspector there and they got along well and their wives got along well and had a wonderful time. They went to um, Europe together and um, Unfortunately, you might have two high-ranking police officers, but it doesn't stop Dad from having his video camera pinched at the airport. We've always used to give him heaps about that. So Dad also, in his police service, when he first arrived at Shepparton, was responsible for the big peaches and cream um, event at Cobram, which used to have about 10,000 people come to. It was a bit like the big day out. And when he was there originally, they only had a very small police presence. And then we had Brian Mannix and the Uncanny X-Men. I was tempted to play some music, but I won't. Um, anyway, got to after 12 and they were supposed to be closing it down and Brian Mannix didn't want to close down. They nearly had a riot and he was inside in the cloud to riot. So Dad ended up just turning the power off. And um, in the next time, two years later, when they had the peaches and green, Dad made sure that just about every branch of the police force was represented. They had boats, they had motorbikes, they had horses, everything you could name. I think there wasn't anybody policeman working in the rest of Victoria. 
So as we mentioned earlier about Dad um, Great Escape. He always had, Dad always had time for his grandchildren. As we all know, he loved to play and do things with us. But he was still very um, careful with his money. So when Ken and I used to write lots of letters when we were living in Newcastle and they were in Melbourne because it was $2 an STD minute and we weren't allowed to ring except on special occasions. So I've been reading through his letters just recently and it's quite amazing um, what Lorene and the family managed to do and um, and what we managed to do at our end and, and coordinate. But the last story I just want to talk about was his great escape. So Dad was unfortunately with his still very fit, riding his push bike 25 kilometres, walking 5 kilometres, still um, very keen on watching movies, still very keen on the cricket and the football. He was a Geelong supporter at, finally, after being Melbourne and Carlton. He finally changed to Geelong when he was living there. And um, Dad's decline with dementia meant that despite his physical health he wasn't capable or safe to leave at home which was very sad for him and for us and he went to stay in Orchard House at Cobram Regional Care so the staff at Orchard House were wonderful with him and they learned his idiosyncrasies and there were he was using a walker, much to his disgust, let me tell you. He said, I do not need this. And after many falls, um, he was still using his walker and at times really had difficulty walking. But I had a phone call one day when it was 36 degrees and the girls were on the end of the phone. Just wondering, Jackie, have you got your dad with you? And I went, uh-oh, because we're the only family in Cobram, so the only person who would be taking him out would be me. And I said, no, but as a nurse, I know what you, that means. I said, I'll be there in five minutes. And we had a discussion. I said, he'll be outside, laying down somewhere, soaking up the sun when everybody else is trying to stay in the cool, or he'll be in somewhere else laying down. So they had all their staff out looking for him. They had <coughs> them outside walking the streets. We had the, our next door neighbour riding his push bike round down the river. We had Ellen and Ben off down the train station and the bus station. And they were going, but your dad wouldn't be able to do that. He can hardly walk. I've got Ken on the end of the phone. We've got by this time an hour's up. The police have to be involved. So the police came up and they were very lovely. We said, let's just keep it quiet. It's a small town. We'll work on things afterwards if we need to. It's getting up to nearly four hours. I was about to become an official movie star, ha ha, and say, you know, my poor dad's missing. Please look for him. And Ken was on the end of the phone. He said, have you looked over the fences? And I said, the staff have, but I haven't. But I'll go and look over the fence and here he is he's got over the corrugated iron fence and he's laying down on the concrete with his head under his head knees in the air and comfortable as comfortable I said oh hi dad you're having a bit of a rest over there aren't you he says oh yes so the police had to come back we went round to the people's house there was nobody home we got in and he's fine meanwhile he goes back he has his soup, his tea, his ice cream and a drink and oblivious. But he had his phone with him, he had his wallet with him and he had a picture of Lorraine, his true love and his partner for 40, 50 years. Um, his picture of Lorraine tucked down his trousers. He was on a mission. And yet before that he had had trouble even remembering who everybody was. So he amazed everybody right to the last minute. And this was only um, a couple of months before he died. Yeah. So with that, he's finally made his great escape. And um, it, for us, it is a great escape from the, the burden of dementia because that's what he never wanted and none of us wanted to see. So um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, thank you.
Some beautiful images there that I'm sure bring back many, many memories. I now ask Emily to step forward to read a verse in memory of Michael. You can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile because he has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that he has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see him, or you can be full of the love that you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he is gone, or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you can do what he would want, smile, open your eyes, love and go on. Thank you, Emily. We're approaching the end of the service today, but before we get there, I would once again like to thank everyone for being here today, for the comfort and condolences you've expressed, and thank you for the kind kindness and friendship you've shown Michael over the time you've known him. And I'd also like to remind you, as Ken said earlier, that the commercial club here in Albury for refreshments afterwards and with the mention of Ken, I'd now ask him to step forward again to read the police oath. Uh, the police oath. As the sun surely sets, dawn will see it rise. For service above self demands its own prize. You have fought the good fight, life's race has been run, and peace your reward for eternity begun. As we that are left shall never forget, rest in peace, friend and colleague, for the sun has now set. And just for um, any police members that might be listening in, we will remember, we will remember, hasten the dawn. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And now we come to the end. Remembering that death is not extinguishing the light. It is only putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. So help us now find peace in our own hearts as we remember Michael. Today we lift up our hearts in gratitude for the life of Michael, for all the goodness bestowed upon him during his life, for all that he was to those who loved him, and for everything in his life that reflected goodness and love. Help us to be confident to release him, to accept his death in the same way that we accepted his life, and to enjoy every day to the full, never holding back on what we believe to be our course in life. May we rejoice in Michael's life, be thankful that his life touched on ours, surround us and all that mourn today with continuing compassion. Do not let grief be without end or overwhelm us, but rather draw us closer together in friendship and love. We want to be thinking not only of the darkness of death, but the splendour of life. So help us even now to face life with courage and hope. Give us the grace and strength to go on knowing that the best tribute we can pay Michael is to let his life be a continuing inspiration to us. And now we come to the committal. So Michael, you will be forever in the memories of all who knew and loved you. And it is with this final goodbye to you that all of us here say, we will remember you until we meet again. <laughs>